Hello, welcome back to Marathon Man, where I'm going through Doctor Who from the very beginning. And you join me at the very first regeneration. At the end of an era, the 10th planet starts in a really low-key way. Uh, it's almost conversational and throwaway as we find ourselves at the snow-capped base in the South Pole, a kind of proto troton base that's about to come under siege. One of Doctor Who's strengths has always been to kind of set up like an everyday normality for the threat to then encroach upon. And the low-key opening here does sort of help that. And I suppose like in its really early, 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 earliest, earliest, earliest planning stages, in its very, very genesis, it wasn't to know that it was going to be the end of an era. The story starts really strongly and the base and its crew are really well drawn and there are some wonderful lines, particularly when Cutler says to the Doctor, And I don't like your face, nor your hair. And Ben and Polly adapt to being in their future. Yeah, I wonder if I got the moon here. It's a very realistic thing for Ben to say, but the answer comes at all and quite so matter-of-factly doesn't sit right with me. The show seems to remember that Ben and Polly are new to time travel, but this story seems to overlook the fact that the, the guest characters, the inhabitants at the base, would be suspicious of such behaviour and wondering why Ben just said that, and not just be suspicious of them as intruders. Surely the people at the base would wonder why Ben had just asked a really stupid question rather than going, oh yeah, we've actually sent loads of people to the moon, old chap. Many of them, very obviously, in your lifetime. Then there is the appearance of Mondas, Earth's twin planet. Now that's a bold idea for the story and there is something vaguely soap opera about a long lost twin returning to wreak havoc. It's just that as in soap opera, the reveal of a twin is almost always disappointing. Their 10th planet is no exception. So here's my uncomfortable truth. I've seen this story held aloft as a classic, but I have never, this time included, been able to agree with that. It may start strongly, but the wheels begin slightly to fall off early, about halfway through episode two, to be precise. I had my doubts in episode one, to be honest. Like, why would Mondas's landmasses, Mondas's landmasses, Mondas's landmasses, have formed in much the same way over time as Earth's? And why would the astronomers of the future, okay, 1986, but still, not have detected a massive planet so close until they do? And here we have a very odd thing in that the threat of the story is increased as it progresses, but the episodes themselves don't seem to have got the memo to up the jeopardy. We're told a lot that things are getting worse, but I never feel invited to feel that along with the characters. Jaunty music after grave statements like we're about to fight the first interplanetary war don't really help with that. Then we are probably going to fight the first interplanetary war. It's a bit like a Hammond organ scoring the destruction of the White House in Independence Day. That said, I haven't really got an issue with the cliffhangers because the idea of hundreds of spaceships heading towards Earth is a good one and that makes it two for two on the cliffhangers by the halfway point. Because I consider the Cybermen themselves here an absolute triumph. That first cliffhanger is rightly celebrated. Their first appearance and their accompanying music is outstanding. Atmospheric, alien and very, very creepy. I can definitely see why they endured. Their faces are terrifying and their voices are chilling. I love them from the off. Maybe probably even more than the Daleks. And the idea of them having no emotions is one thing, but that they removed them voluntarily is really frightening stuff. When they repeatedly ask age, when they go down conversational tangents with the crew, it is great. They make for a really imposing presence and are easily one of the most effective monsters yet. Possibly, maybe even the most effective monster yet. So why does the story disappoint? Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's really only notable for two things. The introduction of the Cybermen and the very first regeneration. And in my opinion, it just doesn't do either of those monumental things much justice. 
I just feel like it's put together really sloppily. Like sometimes it feels like scenes kind of like peter out when they actually had more to give. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not it's because of the adversity they were facing. Like Hartnell's uh, sudden illness and subsequent departure couldn't have made it a very smooth voyage. But that it ends up affecting the story is a real shame to both Hartnell and the Cybermen. They both deserve better. Episode 3 really misses Hartnell. This is only Ben's third story and he has to do a lot of the heavy lifting. He rises to it of course and I think Michael Craze works wonders. He gets stuck in pretty much straight away, taking on the Cybermen single-handedly and being deeply affected when he has to kill one. It's some good character work and makes him more than eligible to travel with the Doctor. I really like Ben, so much so that his habit of talking to himself doesn't actually grate on me unlike most examples of that same cliche. It's just something that I believe he would do. Annika Wills does just as good work, only it feels like with a minuscule percentage of the material. Uh, she gets to make the coffee, and at one point is told, rather pointedly by Barclay, to focus solely on doing that. She also gets to go on the spaceship as the Cybermen's prisoner, so at least she gets some fresh air. Now, it's not, it's not the last time Polly will be marginalised, but it doesn't make it any more palatable here. Then there is the big man himself, even though it's pretty much curtains for him. William Hartnell is still a really welcome presence and he still seems to be giving it his all. Admittedly, even if his all did used to be bigger, I'm not watching, I'm not watching a man giving a half-hearted performance here. Why don't you speak up? I'm Jeff. Is a deliciously sarky bit of Doctor Sass and his speech about emotions in defiance of the Cybermen is a clear sign that he might have actually had more to give despite his failing health. That's easy for me to say though, I didn't have to work with the man. Even though episode two is really the last existing episode Hartnell has in his era and he wouldn't be seen properly again until the three Doctors, the Doctor's return in episode four is still really triumphant. His offer of peace and cohabitation with the Cybermen is a really nice reminder of the Doctor's benevolence coming to the fore despite whatever it is that might face him. He still utterly commits to the role even when he's checking out, which must be the surest sign out of many of how much Hartnell truly loved this part. The new blood in charge might have decided to continue without him, but he's never giving the Doctor any less than he deserves. And the episode's closing moment might not do Hartnell or the Doctor much justice, but he really does knock what little he's given right out of the park. His underplaying of stay warm and then just shuffling off really became quite moving. And the fact that I don't think the episode itself matches his performance makes it a very frustrating viewing experience for me. Maybe that's because it's missing and we don't know I don't know what I'm missing out on and if it came back I'd pick up on some more stuff and I'd hold my hands up and I'd say I'm wrong. It's just that existing as it does, uh, either in a reconstruction or in the animation, when I watch it, it feels like the show is bungling him off rather than mourning him. The animation for episode 4 has been around for quite some time now and I was able to include it on the last marathon. I've said before that I prefer recons to animations as a rule but I find the animation for this really quite well done. I think it follows on from the existing three episodes quite nicely and it obviously acts as a decent dovetail into the animated Power of the Daleks. So, with lots to play with, I don't feel like very much is actually generated. So take Cutler's story with his son for example, that should add another layer of drama but for me it never really lands properly. Yeah, okay, it's going to mean that Cutler doesn't think straight. But as with the jeopardy in the previous episodes and the, t uh, and, and the stakes rising being a case of telling rather than showing, the same is kind of true here. Cutler's personal stakes don't feel, to me, like they make as much of an impact as they should. And so it feels like it's kind of just there rather than actually impacting on anything. And on top of that, episode 3 doesn't just miss the Doctor, it kind of misses the Cybermen too. Now, these brilliant new monsters have only just been introduced and the 10th planet doesn't really do all that much with them or its hero to the point where both are pretty much absent for a whole episode. And so it feels like the own goals just sort of like pile up and 
that's what I mean about it being quite a frustrating viewing experience for me. Because whenever I've watched it, I always end up just sort of like going, why? Although, I will concede, this time, the Doctor falling ill suddenly out of nowhere at the beginning of episode 3 didn't annoy me as much. Yeah, okay, so it's a shame to miss him for episode 3, and Hartnell's sidelining here is a kind of a reason why I don't love this story very much, for whatever reason that sidelining was. It's just that this time around, it felt more like foreshadowing than it did just a hasty workaround of Hartnell's illness. His return with the line that his body is wearing a bit thin only adds to this, but the Cybermen sort of just disintegrating feels underwhelming as a defeat for them, and that that contribute. If you take the regeneration out and think of this as like um, the the Cybermen are the villains, and then they are defeated, it feels like the story ends with a whimper. If it obviously then weren't for what happens to the Doctor and the show as a result. I hadn't wanted to say goodbye to Hartnell, you know that, but it was inevitable. It's just that if that had to be the case, then the next best thing to hope for would be to say goodbye properly. And whenever I've watched The Tenth Planet, I've never truly felt like it does that. Not just because Hartnell winds up a bit shortchanged, not just because we wind up a little bit shortchanged, but also because the bona fide, ingenious concept that is regeneration also ends up feeling a little bit shortchanged. This is a masterstroke when it comes to the idea of having to replace the Doctor. It's in keeping with the show and what little we know of our alien protagonist. It's bold, it's new and it's exciting. It is a doozy of an idea and it makes for a stonking cliffhanger. It just comes after what feels like a really unsatisfying meal. Perhaps it's the most effective one considering my reaction to it. Perhaps it was supposed to be underplayed and stand on its own as a daring plot twist with minimal fuss, in which case it did what it set out to do. I just feel that after 134 episodes, on some level it kind of flips the bird in Hartnell's face a little bit. It should kind of be content to play second fiddle to being like to, to William Hartnell's curtain call. No matter how audacious a gambit it is. A gambit so audacious that it ensured that Doctor Who could still be around today. We are about to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who and even though I can't quite agree that these four episodes are the classic story that it, they're sometimes made out to be, the decisions made here have definitely contributed to that. And maybe that's why this story is considered the classic that it is. I mean, I don't know, of course. I'm not qualified to say. I don't happen to think this story is very good, but thousands do. And it can't just be the fact that it contains the first regeneration that causes them to think that. Either way, it's goodbye to Grandfather, and he really was f***ing incredible. The Cybermen, music and all. The concept of Mondas suddenly appearing like this isn't sold to me in a convincing enough way for the rest of the story to work. I get it, that would be way too low for many of you, and I completely agree that this is one of the most important stories in all of Doctor Who, but I just can't, in all honesty, say that I think it's therefore one of the best. Besides the introduction of the Cybermen and the curveball of the Doctor changing his face, I do find very little of note in the Tenth Planet. As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this apparent going against the grain, then you know how YouTube works. Please give it a like and share the word. It really does help the channel in its infancy and therefore the marathon. And what do you think of the Tenth Planet? Do you find it as damp a squib of an ending for the first Doctor's era as I do? Or are you apoplectic with rage that I haven't recognised its status as the classic it obviously is? How are the Cybermen in their first appearance? Do you think they're at their best or do you think they improve with further appearances? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you back here soon for a few videos dedicated to the first Doctor. Firstly, a brief overview of his adventures in expanded media followed by a ranking of all of the first Doctor's TV stories up to this point and then a uh, kind of an overview of William Hartnell and the first Doctor's era. So if you don't want to miss those, hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell and I will see you soon.